ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Chatham House. I'm delighted uh, you could come and join us uh, this afternoon um, where we have, uh, I think, a wonderful opportunity um, to host uh, Francis Fukuyama um, here at the Institute uh, and to have an opportunity to hear part two, as I think is the right way of putting it, of um, what is a, uh, a large historical take at the concepts of political order. Um, and what we'll be discussing today specifically is uh, political order and political decay. Um, and this is uh, the companion uh, piece to the book that he wrote in uh, 2011, The Origins. Uh, sorry, his most current one, The Origins of Political Order. Um, so uh, we have an opportunity to really uh, delve into the structure of international relations and the structure of history uh, as much as we do into the current events of today. But the issues that he is discussing in his new book um, are specifically questions of how to maintain well-functioning modern states uh, in a particularly complex uh, world at the moment, something that I think we as uh, Brits, and I can still use the term uh, currently, <laughs> are particularly aware of at the moment. So there is a, a poignancy and an immediacy uh, to the topics that uh, Dr. Fukuyama will be undertaking today. Um, he is the Olivier uh, Nomellini Senior Fellow at the Freeman Sprogley Institute for International Studies at Stanford. Um, obviously uh, made his mark and his career uh, with the seminal book of the end of history, political order, and uh, with the end of history, which was uh, right around the time of the end of the Cold War 1989. Um, in fact, just preceded the fall of the Berlin Wall when it came out and quite rightly gave him um, a, a renown uh, which we're going to be able to now see him live up to with his new book. He's had the benefit of working also in government and policy planning, um, uh, involved with numerous organizations, helped set up uh, the American Interest, uh, which he founded and serves on its editorial board. Um, but uh, Dr. Fukuyama, we're delighted that you take the time out uh, with the launch of your new book to come and speak to Chatham House, share your thoughts, and also take questions from our members here. This is being live streamed, so hopefully we'll get a few questions as well in on Twitter. But uh, thank you very much okay. indeed. We look forward to your remarks. On the record, phones off, please. Great, thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's really a great delight to be in London and to, uh, you know, I, it, it's strange, but I believe this is my first uh, time at Chatham House, and so it's a really a great opportunity to connect with this audience, and this is the beginning of my book tour, so you're the first actually to hear this uh, presentation. So I, I thought it would be good to actually uh, begin by talking about the world uh, as it is in 2014. It's not very good uh, right now. Uh, this has been a remarkable year in terms of political uh, instability. And it does seem to me, if you think about the world as a whole, it's, it's become bifurcated in a uh, very striking way. So what Zbigniew Brzezinski used to call the arc of crisis, the entire area from North Africa through Sub-Saharan Africa, the Middle East, often to South Asia, uh, is obviously in a tremendous amount of turmoil. You have simultaneous state failure in Libya, uh, Syria, uh, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, uh, Yemen, uh, and uh, the spreading of um, Islamist terrorism uh, out of uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan and into, um, into the Sahel uh, and in places like uh, northern Nigeria. Uh, I actually, uh, we can discuss this in the Q&A period, I actually think that in the long run, uh, this brand of Islamic radicalism is not uh, the most serious threat faced by world order, but it becomes uh, extremely serious because of the weakness of states. And I think that this is the characteristic of that part of the world. Uh, the, you know, the, the main characteristic is uh, the lack of government. And the reason uh, that uh, Boko Haram and other Islamist groups are making headway in places like northern Nigeria is the utter uh, uh, incompetence of states and their inability to do the most basic thing that states are supposed to do, which is to provide uh, physical security for uh, their citizens. And in fact, uh, the terrorism has been moving. It's, it's like being attracted to a vacuum uh, into places uh, in which this kind of political weakness exists. 
Another part of the world uh, operates very, very differently, uh, which is Eurasia. And I think the other big source of instability in 2014 is at both ends of Eurasia, with Russia and China uh, now advancing territorial claims that uh, I think are extremely upsetting to <clears throat> the kind of political settlement that emerged at the end uh, of the Cold War. China has been a state, uh, this, is a, uh, this is a story that I told in the first volume of my book about the rise of the Chinese state because I believe that Western interpretations of China have failed to recognize that they were actually the first civilization not to create a state but to create a modern state, that is to say a state that was centralized, bureaucratic, and uh, had aspirations to be impersonal. And uh, it is off of those deep wells of, uh, of stateness that the current Chinese regime uh, is built. And in fact, there are huge continuities between the way that the Communist Party rules China today and dynastic China. Uh, and they have a lot of experience with this. Uh, Russia, I would say, is much less successful as a state, certainly in terms of delivering basic uh, services, but it is uh, without question a classically strong uh, great power. And both of these countries are posing, uh, in a way, um, uh, very familiar kinds of challenges in terms of making territorial claims, in terms of supporting uh, co-ethnics abroad uh, and the like. And those are challenges that have to be dealt with in geopolitical terms uh, that I think uh, uh, it's not a happy situation, but at least it's one that's a little bit more uh, familiar to uh, Europeans and Americans than the kind of stateless threat that is being posed uh, in those parts of the world. This is, uh, I think, the fundamental bifurcation in the world today. Uh, it's really not over authoritarianism versus democracy. It is over parts of the world that are able to maintain uh, coherent, uh, uh, effective states and, and those in which states either have not emerged, uh, like Afghanistan or Somalia, or ones in which uh, they have uh, broken down. And a lot of American foreign policy, as well as uh, foreign policy of this country, in the stateless part of the world has been directed actually trying to create state institutions where they don't exist. The exit strategies out of Iraq and Afghanistan were completely bound up uh, with the effort to produce some kind of a basic political uh, structure. Americans, I think, uh, naively thought they could create democracies in both places. I think today uh, Washington would be extremely happy if they could simply hang on as countries uh, and not be overwhelmed uh, uh, by uh, terrorists of various uh, sorts. And so that's really what's defined foreign policy in uh, much of the past uh, 15 uh, years, is this effort of outsiders to try to create uh, state institutions. And it's a toolbox that we still do not really possess. Uh, and I think that's been one of the fundamental frustrations. How do you get a place like Nigeria to actually be able to suppress an insurgency in, uh, in its own north? So that's one part of the question, but the other part is that democracies, established democracies, uh, in many respects, uh, are not um, uh, doing all that well uh, in certain fundamental ways. The story about democracy in the contemporary democratic world is complex, and I think some parts of that world are doing extraordinarily well. Germany has been riding high for much of the past uh, uh, 15, 20 years, a lot of Scandinavia, the Netherlands, and so forth. But there are other parts of the democratic world that have been doing uh, rather poorly, uh, and I would point to my own country uh, as an example of this. Uh, I think that um, the American system of checks and balances was uh, designed in, in certain respects to deal with the problem of overweening uh, centralized power and in a way it's been too successful and as a result of the way that polarization interacts with uh, the existing check and balance uh, institutions, we get to a situation like we have now. The American Congress has not passed a budget by its own rules since 2008. Uh, last year we had a shutdown of the federal government in which it would have been a criminal offense for any federal employee to actually show up uh, for work for the period that the shutdown was happening and this was brought about because of a basic disagreement uh, in Congress as to whether the United States should pay its past debts. Uh, and so I think that 
you know, as a, as a model of democracy, uh, the interaction of uh, the kinds of changes in American society that have been going on uh, with the kinds of political institutions that we have uh, has been producing a, a situation that I characterize uh, as one of political decay in which uh, very well organized and very powerful interest groups can essentially stop the government from doing uh, anything that it, uh, that, that particular group uh, finds objectionable or contrary to its interests. And since there are a lot of very powerful interest groups, it really means that it's pretty hard to accomplish uh, anything. And I think that this has had a very negative impact. And there are other countries in this situation, Japan and Italy, I would say among major democracies, have also had very comparable problems in actually generating the basic social consensus and therefore political power uh, to fix some of the big underlying problems uh, that, they, uh, that they face. And so this is the issue that I'm trying to deal with in this book, is where does basic political order uh, come from? Where does the state come from? I think that uh, we in the West, and particularly us Americans, are very much focused on the institutions of electoral accountability and rule of law that limit the capacity of, of governments to tyrannize over their, uh, over their fellow citizens. So even today in the United States, you'll hear Tea Party people say that Obama is a tyrant. I mean, I think this is one of the most absurd <laughs> characterizations because as far as I'm concerned, Obama is probably one of the weakest presidents uh, we've had in, in, in you know, several generations. Uh, but, you know, this is the consciousness that it is the consciousness of the misuse of state power and not, uh, and, and, and relatively little focus on how state power uh, is to be generated. This is a point that was made by my mentor, Samuel Huntington, uh, in his classic book, uh, Political Order and Changing Societies, back in 1968, where he said, before you can limit power, uh, you have to be able to generate power. Uh, and that this is actually the problem in much of the developing world is the basic uh, absence of stateness. Uh, so the framework in which I look at the, uh, this, this problem uh, is the following, that any modern political regime, any modern political order basically has to have three components. Uh, it has to have a state, uh, it has to have a state that according to Max Weber is a monopoly of legitimate uh, force over a defined territory. And the force part of it is very important because the state is really about uh, the ability to coerce in the, uh, at the end, uh, but it is about legitimate coercion, uh, authority that is exercised on behalf of the whole community. And one of the most important distinctions is another one that Max Weber made between a patrimonial state and a modern state. Patrimonial state is basically an extension of the ruler's household. It's run for the benefit uh, of the ruler, his family, and friends. Uh, and that is actually the characterization of government in very much of the developing world at the moment. Again, I don't want to pick on Nigeria particularly, but uh, if you want a really great example of that, uh, it's a country that's generated four or five hundred billion dollars in oil revenues over the past generation, still has a poverty rate of about 70%, if you ask where all that money went, uh, it basically went into the pockets of the elite that, that rules the country, which has bought its stability, uh, but very little else in terms of development. And so the critical, the really critical issue is the one that I called getting to Denmark, which is how do you get from that kind of a state that's basically a state controlled and run by insiders, how do you get that kind of state to be an impersonal state? that treats all of its citizens, qua citizens, with uh, you know, the same degree of, of, of uh, distance and uh, respect. And that, I would uh, assert, is kind of the central, the central governance issue in development. All right, so that's one institution. The second institution is the rule of law, uh, which reflects community views of justice, but it has to be binding on the rulers uh, if it is to be the rule of law, and so it is fundamentally a limitation of state power. And then finally, uh, institutions of democratic accountability that try to guarantee that power will be used on behalf of the community as a whole and not simply uh, on behalf of the interests of the particular elite that's ruling the community. So any political order is really actually a very difficult balancing act. On the one hand, between a state and hopefully a modern state that can exercise power, 
on the one hand, and then the rule of law uh, and uh, uh, democracy, democratic accountability on the other that try to uh, limit power. And I would say that all of the world's regimes can be arrayed somewhere on that spectrum. And so the problem uh, really in Russia and China is the fact that they've got very strong states with very few uh, checks and balances, a very you know, high degree of discretion, little uh, limitation of power. Uh, on the other hand, uh, a place like the United States or India, or I would say a number of other democracies in which you have a large number of checks and balances which when combined with a high degree of social mistrust and polarization uh, produce uh, very uh, ineffective uh, government. So I want to just run through a couple of more specific ways in which this plays out. The book is very long and so I cover really a lot of topics, but I want to highlight a couple. So one has to do with uh, corruption and the other one has to do actually with the particular dysfunctions in, um, uh, in the United States. So let's begin with the question of corruption. As I said, I think that the issue of effective governance and corruption is really the central dividing line uh, that, that exists in the world. Uh, you know, authoritarianism versus democracy is, of course, uh, important, but many of our recent conflicts are really over the quality of government. So, let me give you several examples. Ukraine, uh, the big failure of the Orange Revolution in 2004 was the fact that the Orange Coalition could not govern. It could not govern. It, it was itself highly corrupt. Uh, the leaders spent all their time bickering uh, among themselves. They basically kept up this rent-seeking and rent-redistributing uh, system with the result that Viktor Yanukovych was reelected in 2010. And the fundamental struggle that uh, went on between Euromaidan and, uh, and the, the Yanukovych government was not over democracy. I mean, this guy was democratically uh, elected. Uh, it was fundamentally over whether Ukraine was going to be run by a kind of internal, you know, kleptocratic, rent-seeking mafia uh, like the one that is currently ruling Russia. And again, I think the fundamental issue in values and institutions uh, now between the West and Russia is not strictly speaking, uh, 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 democracy versus authoritarianism. It is really that question about whether uh, uh, you want to be ruled by uh, this kind of, um, uh, kind of uh, self-seeking uh, corrupt elite. And one of the biggest struggles that the Ukrainians now have to face is having learned from the mistakes of the Orange Revolution, whether they can actually make democracy work, not by making it electorally accountable, because that's the easy part uh, that they got in the, in the past decade. The, the much harder part is whether they can make their, uh, their state work. But you know, there's many other uh, examples of this. Uh, in India, uh, there was a study by Jean Drez back in the late 1990s that showed that 50% in, in, in many of the poor northern states like Uttar Pradesh and so forth, 50% of school teachers were not showing up for work. They were being paid, but they were not showing up for work. And 10 years later, this raised a huge hue and cry within India, a lot of political agitation uh, to correct that situation. 10 years later, they did another survey, and it turned out that exactly the same percentage of teachers were not showing up for work. And this, in a sense, indicates what the nature of the problem is. There isn't anyone in India that will get up and say, yes, teachers ought to go to work and not get, and they ought to uh, get paid and not, not show up for their jobs every day. I mean, nobody believes this. Everybody thinks that education is a goal, and yet this is a problem that seems to be, on, be beyond the ability of uh, the political system to correct, uh, and it points to, I think, you know, a fundamental issue in uh, democracy because democratic electoral accountability is supposed to not let this sort of thing happen. Nobody wants teachers to not show up for work. Nobody wants public corruption. And the theory is that democracies ought to be able to fix this because the voters will just vote the rascals out. And yet, in one democratic country after another, this fails to happen. Uh, in the case of India, I think a lot of it has to do with the nature of patronage and clientelism that makes people vote for certain leaders based on their ability to distribute uh, uh, individual favors to, you know, to, to their constituents, but it means that the country cannot really mobilize along lines that would be 
sufficient to generate an anti-corruption uh, 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 coalition, and that's one of the great struggles that that country has to, uh, has to deal with. Um, if you do read my uh, second volume, you'll see that there's a way out, <laughs> uh, which uh, is really the story about the United States during the progressive era, uh, in which uh, the American government from top to bottom, from the federal down to the lowliest municipality was similarly clientelistic and uh, patronage based, and yet uh, there was a development of a middle class coalition that got past that, uh, that problem, and I think that this is essentially the political struggle uh, that Mexico, India, Brazil, Turkey, very many uh, countries that are democratic and, and, and have basic institutions of accountability, but this is the further struggle uh, that they really have to uh, engage in. Uh, let me just conclude by saying a little bit about, um, uh, about the United States because uh, this is a subject that I think, as I said, was, um, you know, uh, makes a difference not just to Americans but I think to the rest of the world because of the kind of uh, image that the United States uh, projects. Uh, the United States, uh, as you're probably familiar, never liked big government. Uh, the whole reason that we have a uh, <laughs> country in the first place is Americans didn't like George III and they wanted to create a constitutional system that distributed power so that nobody would be able to exercise power uh, in that fashion. Uh, and the, you know, the wellsprings of, I think, the current uh, American problem uh, lie very deeply in that. I think during the progressive era, there was a strong move to create a modern state, a modern impersonal bureaucratic state uh, in the U.S., but uh, I think that in, it, you know, it never achieved the kind of modernity that existed in the parliamentary systems, either in the Commonwealth or in uh, continental Europe. And over the past generation, we've actually gone back. Now, I give a very long explanation for why that happens. In the United States, uh, we prefer courts over administrative hierarchies to enforce laws. And so uh, in my state of California, we have this thing called the... Uh, Private Enforcement Act in which any California citizen can sue the government either to enforce or decease from uh, enforcing a law and it makes uh, governance extremely inefficient uh, because everybody uh, is, is threatened um, with lawsuits. And by the way, this is not the private litigation that we're familiar with. This is, you know, this is litigation against uh, public authorities. But I think the bigger problem has to do with what I call repatrimonialization, which I think is a, at the heart of political decay. In the United States, we have a very narrow definition of corruption. Corruption has to be a very specific quid pro quo uh, transaction between uh, a politician and, and a private citizen. Uh, but in fact, I think we have recreated um, the patronage system of the 19th century uh, through different means. Uh, it's basically through a kind of legalized uh, gift exchange in which uh, politicians are influenced fundamentally uh, by money or by promises of support or even by, you know, ideas in a certain sense in a way that when combined with our uh, check and balance political system make it extremely powerful, as I said, for well-organized interest groups uh, to stop things. And so there's, there's lots of examples that I could uh, uh, proliferate. Obamacare and the Dodd-Frank Act, the two biggest initiatives of the Obama administration, I think are better, it's better to have them than to have nothing, but as pieces of legislation, they are simply monstrosities because of all the concessions that had to be made to these uh, interest groups. And then uh, if we're ever going to do something like uh, entitlement reform, uh, it's going to be nearly impossible because uh, these well-organized interests that are inevitably going to suffer as a result of this are simply too strong to permit you know, the, the, the collectivity uh, to go ahead. So this is not a very optimistic way to end. Uh, I do think, however, that democracies do have resources. And by the way, I should make clear, I actually don't think American civilization is at all in decline. Uh, I think that the American private sector, you look at energy or where I live in Silicon Valley, it's still unbelievably innovative, uh, uh, we're doing the best of really any part of the uh, developed world in terms of, I think, fundamental uh, innovation and competitiveness. But the government is a different thing, and governments are important in the present-day world. Uh, I think it will probably take an external shock of some sort uh, you know, to get us to get our act together. 
Uh, but in the meantime, this is a challenge because I think political decay uh, is something that historically happens to everybody. Uh, and simply because you are a developed democracy does not mean that you are exempt from, uh, from this, um, uh, this problem. Uh, and uh, there's no automatic mechanism in history that means that once you've turned, you know, there's no ratchet that means once you're a liberal democracy, uh, you're there for good because uh, human agency, both uh, for us as individuals and as communities, uh, still matters a great deal. So thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank, thank you, Francis, very much for, for laying out um, both a, a tableau of how the world is changing and also some very core messages here. One about the arc of crisis expanding, as you said, in particular across Asia. Um, the territorial claims and the, the, what some people have described as kind of more 19th century mentality of, of East Asia, but then the worrying sign of the weaknesses of our own system. And I thought it was interesting that you would stand out and say that corruption, which we tend to associate as a word mm -hmm. uh, more with developing parts of, uh, of the world, you use that word, I think, pretty explicitly to talk about uh, what is taking place in the United States and some mm -hmm. of its uh, dysfunctionality in particular. You said about the loose definition of corruption that's emerged there. Could I just take advantage and I'll do a quick first question, then open it up to everyone here, and you've given us plenty of time to, to be able to get into questions. Um, your, your first uh, book of this, of this series, The Origins of Political Order, so it took us up to, as I understand it, uh, French Revolution, American Revolution, in a way the dawn of industrialization. And it strikes me that in, the process of industrialization tends to bring about or creates a demand for strong governments. Um, you know, governments need to be effective, they need to provide infrastructure, you need to educate people to speak similar languages, uh, or well, the same language, ideally, so they can work in, in big mechanized systems. You need some element of welfare yes. in return. It almost seems that industrialization perhaps created the strong state. And if you look mm -hmm. at how China's become strong again, it's been in an mm -hmm. industrialization period. But we're in a sort of post-industrial world. And certainly what your part of the world, uh, Silicon Valley, has been driving is a kind of destructive, yes. uh, disruptive process that's disrupting economies, but maybe in disrupting economies is also disrupting political systems. And mm -hmm. I'm just wondering to what extent in your new book, you, you, which is this period from the industrial into the technology mm -hmm. era, um, you see the connections between those two things. I mean, yeah. uh, and it's a big question, but I mean, just some, some pointers on that would be interesting. No, I actually uh, have a section of the book that deals with economic and technological change and democracy, and I think the connection is, is very uh, clear. You know, I, I basically fundamentally agree with Barrington Moore, who said, no bourgeoisie, no democracy. Now, the <laughs> relationship is not a simple or a linear one, but fundamentally, when people have a certain degree of education, and I would define middle class more in occupational and education terms rather than yes. simply through income distribution, uh, they, they behave differently politically, and I think it's a cross-cultural phenomenon. So the kinds of uprisings that you saw in Turkey or in Brazil last year, who are, who, who are the people that are out on the streets? They're the well-educated, young, well-connected, uh, you know, new middle classes in, in those countries. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that uh, the middle class is actually a big boon to democracy, uh, or, or let's, let's put it differently. Uh, they want political participation. You know, they yeah. want recognition, they want political participation. Whether you actually get to democracy is another big issue because there you need you know, institutions, political parties, all, all sorts of things. But there's no question that that's one of the drivers. And if China's system changes over time, it's going to be, you know, the four or five hundred million middle class Chinese that are going to be the drivers. However, there's two really big uh, threats that, that this poses. First is that, again, this was a point that Huntington used to make quite clearly. It's, it's this expectations gap mm -hmm. that many democratic systems cannot keep up with the rising expectations of their own middle class. So that's exactly what's going on in Brazil right now. You know, buses, you know, public transport. I mean very creaky infrastructure, high degrees of corruption in the political class. You know, young Brazilians don't want this. I mean, they actually may vote Marina Silva uh, 
mm. president, you know, because they think that you know she may be able to do something about that. So that's a good example where the system is being delegitimated mm. by uh, the rising expectations of the middle class. But then uh, this is something I'm particularly conscious of living in Silicon Valley. Uh, the middle class itself is under threat, uh, particularly in these Anglo-Saxon countries uh, that um, Anglo-American countries that have had pretty un uh, you know unfettered labor markets and, and competition. That technological advance has been eating away uh, at especially low and middle and increasingly now middle class mm -hmm. jobs uh, for some time now. If you look at median incomes in the United States, uh, they're about eight percent in 2014. They're about eight percent below where they were uh, on the eve of the financial crisis in 2007. Uh, and actually, they've been largely stagnant. I mean, total income is different because we still do a lot of redistribution, mm -hmm. but the actual incomes have basically been stagnant for, you know, for two decades mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. And that's not good for democracy. It's really not good for democracy because it's setting up this highly polarized Latin American kind of situation where you have you know, a very small group of people that are doing extremely well and a lot of people that are uh, not sharing in, that, uh, in, in economic growth. Thank you. Well, look, let me take some questions. I can see hands going up, and I'll take them as I see them, if that's all right. First, with the, the little red. Might be a new iPhone 6. I'm not quite sure what it is, actually. <laughs> Jonathan, no. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Jonathan Isle from uh, Royal United Services Institute. Uh, I mean, you used the term political decay, and you hinted at the possibility that this is a biological phenomenon, in which case it is unstoppable. Uh, or is it stoppable? Namely, do you have any rejuvenation techniques uh, that yeah. would stop it? And what I mean is, uh, is it stoppable from above rather than below, which is how we usually assume the rejuvenation to take place? Is it stoppable from above by governments who impose certain changes? Let us take the anti-corruption measures or that the Chinese have ordered from above down. Or is it all a make-believe? <laughs> Uh, no, it's certainly stoppable. Um, so I actually do have a somewhat biological explanation. I mean, in my view, political decay is both the cognitive rigidity where a set of institutions is created under one set of circumstances, the circumstances change, and there's no adaptation. But the other is what I would call insider capture, where, uh, and this is the biological part, I think just human beings tend to want to reward their own friends and family. Uh, and insiders will use the political system to do that over time. And this was true in Han, you know, the late Han Dynasty in China. It was true for the, you know, the Janissaries in, in the Ottoman Empire. It was true for all the venal office holders uh, in the old regime, in, in um, Ancien Regime France. Uh, and I think you know, increasingly it, it's, it characterizes uh, the American uh, political elite. And I think this is where democracy can actually help because as I said, at least in theory, people can mobilize with the right kind of leadership uh, to stop this. Uh, and I think, in fact, in the 1930s, you saw an example of this in the New Deal. Uh, you had a lot of concentrated political power that led to a you know, very terrible crisis. And there was an appropriate uh, mobilization, not in, in favor of a fascist movement as happened in Europe, but you know, through the use of democratic uh, uh, means to change institutions, to create new ones uh, that basically got at a lot of the basic problems. And one of the things that I find a little bit dismaying is that despite we, the fact we had a crisis that was not as bad as the Great Depression, but was the largest one since the Depression, that did not fundamentally change things in the United States. Hmm. Uh, and in fact, you know, the financial sector is more concentrated today than it was on the eve of that crisis. Uh, uh, I think actually on the right we've had this weird result that people are even more you know, committed to the ideas that they had uh, you know, prior to the crisis that if you cut taxes you'll spur growth such that you, know, you won't have a budget deficit. I mean people still run around believing mm -hmm. this and so I do think you see evidence of political decay uh, you know, in, in, uh, you know, in the U.S. at the moment. Right. Uh, sorry, uh, yes, here first. Okay. Yeah. Um, yes, please, microphone coming. Just uh, help also for the live stream. 
construction, uh, you know, maintain the rule of law, so you can challenge the established order and not end up in prison. And I put it to you, it still is very much a battle between authoritarianism and democracy, say in China. Because how can China rebalance its economy without the rule of law, without giving people protection when they establish, establish interests? For example, if you're just uh, uh, threatening major businesses in China with a new innovation, you could end up in prison. Yeah. And look at the big multinationals, the Western companies, who made their governments remain silent about human rights abuses in China, forgetting, of course, the flip side of that is the rule of law. And now they find themselves, with no rule of law, putting their investments in serious jeopardy. Indeed, I would argue that anybody who invests in a jurisdiction no rule of law is guilty of negligence. So I just put it to you, the glorious revolution of the United Kingdom, many, we are perhaps Western capitalism, from Western development, we are great deal that, in giving the disruptors, if you like, that kind of legal protection. Thank you. No, I, I completely agree, and I don't want to give you the impression that I don't think that rule of law and democracy are not extremely important. So as I was saying, uh, the problem in a country like China is precisely uh, too much discretionary authority uh, party that's not accountable and it's not limited by rules. I mean, I would say that compared to other authoritarian regimes, uh, it is impressive that the Chinese actually do have certain rules that others don't, like they've got term limits. Mm. Uh, if Mubarak or Gaddafi or any of these Arab dictators had stepped down after 10 years, I think they would be much more favorably remembered. Mm -hmm. And you know, the Chinese have worked their way. But you're, abs you're, you're fundamentally right that the basic problem in China is the limitation of concentrated uh, state power. So that's why I'm saying, you know, you've got these two parts of the world where, um, uh, and, and, and furthermore, I think it's correct that actually democracy is going to help in that fight against corruption because part of the reason they can get away with that level of corruption is that it's all hidden and there's no mechanisms other than a great purge of the sort that's going on now to you know, to really stop it. So there are different problems in different parts of the world, but uh, authoritarianism still, you know, is a, is a big challenge. But you, just quickly on this point of the rule of law, because you made it one of your three key elements, do you think a country like China could institute the rule of law in the economic sphere and manage to be as authoritarian about how it interprets the rule of law in the political sphere? In other words, you, you could have full transpired and be full a heavy element of transparency on economic interactions, et cetera, and yet not apply I, I think that's very hard to do. You know, I think that that was their hope. Uh, so they've got this big you know, body of commercial law now that's supposed to govern uh, their transactions, especially with foreigners. But I think unless you get the Communist Party to accept the fact that it itself is subject to the law. So that, you know, that's an important <laughs> part of the definition, that mm. the rule of law is not just having rules. I mean, that's rules by, rule by law. Rule of law consists of the elites in the society also believing that they are subject to the same exactly. uh, kinds of rules. And the Chinese are not there yet. And, so, and, and I think that whatever rules they come up with for dealing with foreigners are always going to be vulnerable unless the party itself believes that it is subject to rules. Great. There's a lady waiting here first. Yep. I've got you. Yeah. Hello. Um, Millicent Scott from the European Parliament Office in the UK. Uh, you've talked about uh, national elites and the role of nation states. I'd be very interested in hearing what you have to say about the role of insti uh, international institutions and transnational political organization. Thank you. Right. Yeah, well, get into Europe. You managed to avoid Europe, I thought, pretty well there. Yeah. There's, well, there's uh, a lot of institutional stuff going on there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I think that, yeah, so you're right that, I, you know, there's a number of nation, you know, member nations in Europe, I think, whose democratic systems are working well. But the EU is obviously not working well in, in certain very fundamental ways. And actually, I think that, you know, one of the big constitutional problems within the EU is that it's got excessively strong powers in the wrong areas and then completely absent powers in the, in the areas that really count, right? So the Brussels can annoy people endlessly making up all these rules about cheeses and, you know, wines and things like that. But, you know, where it really counts, which is in basically fiscal and monetary authority, compared to the United States, it is way too weak, and that's why uh, 
uh, you had this big uh, euro crisis. The other uh, problem, and I know that, I, I mean, a lot of Europeans get really upset when I say this, but I just don't think that Europe has, ident uh, has invested nearly adequately in the creation of actually a European identity. Uh, that the hope was that Europe would be post-national and that people would think of themselves as Europeans. That just hasn't happened, you know. I mean, a Greek and a German today are much, much more aware of themselves as Greeks and Germans than they were 10, 15 years ago. I mean, but, nobody's but, kidding anybody. How, how could you invest in that, France? You said they haven't invested enough in it. How do you invest in creating an identity? Well, I guess the issue is that, and, and by the way, so we can get to a discussion of Britain as well. Well, I'm this respect. partly... <laughs> Have so, we invested enough? Yeah. So the, the, you know, the thing is that a lot of people, so in Europe, the emphasis was on what Europe was not. So it wasn't these old clashing you know, nationalisms that characterized the 20th century. Uh, but there was never an effort to identify positively you know, what Europe stood for, yeah. what values, uh, apart from endless toleration, uh, <laughs> which you know, is, is important and it's part of a liberal order, but it's not... You know, it's not yeah. something that, that really can define a civilization. Uh, I think that that's the sort of thing that, that needed to happen. And then there's this kind of hope that simple yeah. economic interchange mm -hmm. would, would somehow create uh, a sense of solidarity that would make people want to sacrifice for one another. But, you know, fundamentally, national, national identity means I'm willing to die for this, you know, this larger collectivity. And who's willing to die for the EU at the moment? I mean, I just... <laughs> Uh, you know, we'll, we'll see. We'll see how the Ryder Cup does uh, this weekend. Yeah. That's one place where European identity seems to emerge, principally against America. I'm doing the order in which I've seen the hands. Gentlemen here, I've got you, sir, but for later. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Nick Greenstock uh, from Gatehouse and a Chatham House member. Um, I, looking at the way in which governments are forced to respond in this kind of era of globalization, they're kind of being stretched into the international, and then the kind of populist response to globalization has been almost Newtonian to a very kind of local elements of an extreme localism, tribal almost, and governments are yet a set at that national level to deliver in that space. How do you see the evolution of governments to be able to contend with issues that are beyond their borders and those that are uh, kind of elementing themselves in, in a, a very localized form? Well, um, yeah, in the current book, I kind of punted on that question because um, I really was you know, concerned with governments uh, much more at a national uh, level. But you know, there's no question that so many of the problems that we face today are really ones that cannot be solved at that level, particularly in, you know, in a place like Europe uh, that's so interdependent. And you know, there's obviously a big deficit of the appropriate institutions that you know, can, can provide that, that degree of governance. Uh, you know, my expectation had been that what you would develop, so I think that you know, turning the world into something that looks like a nation state is just a fool's errand because mm -hmm nation states have to be based on, you know, at least a, a core of shared values that simply, I mean, those shared values don't exist increasingly in existing uh, nation states and, and, you know, creating them, you know, for the globe as a whole, I think is uh, hopeless. But, you know, my concept was something I called multi-multilateralism in which actually a plethora of overlapping and sometimes competing uh, international bodies uh, could provide a lot of the governance mechanisms that would be necessary. And to some extent, you know, and kind of relatively apolitical things like standard setting and, and so forth that, that already uh, exist. The problem is when you get to a more political level where there are really important, you know, differences that, that, that need to be solved politically, uh, we just don't have um, uh, the appropriate institutions. And this is why I say I'm punting because I don't really see a clear way out of this. I think, you know, efforts, all the reform efforts that have been proposed over the last 20 years, for example, to strengthen the Security Council, I think are actually going to weaken it because mm. it's going to make it harder to actually come to a consensus on, on uh, what to do. And I don't see an obvious way, uh, obvious way out. And, and something like the Trans-Pacific Partnership, I'm talking about these efforts to create what might be an overlapping multilateral institution of the WTO. Do you think these are helpful, this, this, you know, what well, President Obama's been doing that and the, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership? These well, are efforts to... Yes, I do think that 
Yeah, I mean, I, so the economists all say, oh, no, no, this regional stuff is bad because you need a global system. But I think as a second best, uh, it's, it's good. The other thing is that, especially with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, there is a political dimension to it that the mm. <laughs> trade and investment people don't always get, uh, which is that this is really a, a story about China and you know the effort uh, of uh, countries more committed to property rights and rule of law, you know, to express a certain uh, amount of solidarity in the economic sphere, with the hopes that this becomes the basis for you know greater uh, political solidarity as well. And I think in that respect, I'm all for it. Good. Question right at the back, lady being very patient, right in the middle. Keep your hand up, please. Keep your hand up. There you go. This microphone's coming round the side to you. Thank you. I've got, uh, I've got you. Samad Salman, member Chatham House. Uh, you made a very interesting point about um, the extreme case of checks and balances that exists in the United States um, and, and, and the way that uh, that creates a weaker centralized government. So what we've seen in the past decade or so is a rush for, of the corporation to come in and fill that vacuum. And given that um, a democracy is um, accountable to the electorate and corporations are largely accountable to their major stakeholders, the Monsantos, the Co Koch brothers, um, you know, Halliburtons are now sort of the elite ruling class. So mm -hmm. how can America still be defined as sort of a pure de democracy in the case where you have an elite group of shareholders essentially uh, generating a large part of the power uh, in the United States? Well, um, I think to be fair, if you look at the world, there is a, a very powerful civil society sector that's out there. I mean, you talk to a Shell executive, you know, trying to do an investment deal in Nigeria or another place, whether they've got a free hand just because they're a multinational corporation to do whatever they want, that, you know, they'll tell you, well, I mean, there's some pretty powerful, you know, interest groups organized in the other direction. And I think a lot of international civil society sees itself, you know, explicitly as an effort to balance that corporate sector. Now, you might argue that, in fact, uh, it's a very <clears throat> one-sided game. Corporations are more mobile. They have more capital and resources. Uh, but I wouldn't underestimate, uh, you know, the, um, you know, the power of international civil society right now to generate a certain degree of uh, countervailing force. I would say that the problem is uh, one of accountability because actually neither the corporate sector nor the civil society groups are actually clearly accountable to the people that they claim to be uh, representing. And that's a kind of governance problem mm -hmm. that I think really fundamentally needs to be uh, resolved because there's a lot of times when, let's say, an environmental group claiming to speak on behalf of, you know, indigenous peoples or the environment or something actually is just speaking on, on their own behalf and, and are really disconnected with any larger, you know, what, any real effort to represent, uh, 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 you know, real people out in the world. I'm conscious I've got a lot of hands going up and I want to try and get as many as possible. So if you don't mind, Francis, I'm going to That's take fine. a couple of pairs of questions. First gentleman's been waiting patiently at the front here. Thank you uh, for your remarks. My name is Andrew Bunnell, a uh, graduate student at the University of Cambridge and also a member of Chatham House. Um, to follow on what was just asked, uh, very fascinated by your uh, remarks about corruption, especially specifically in the American context. Um, with constitutional values, it seems today that almost anyone in America can be an interest group. Uh, where do you uh, dig into the tension between uh, constitutional uh, abilities to gather, to send your elected representatives up there to speak on your behalf, and yet have a society in which everyone is fragmented? And is that just a case where yeah. you need an outside shock to change that? And if so, do you think that would be economic? Yeah. Like the hold depression. Up, if you can hold your answer to that one, because okay. help, that'll help discipline your, okay. your answers. And not discipline, but you know what I'm saying. The amount of time we've got. Please here, yep, in the front. Yep. OK. Uh, OK. Gentleman was waiting there, patiently, in that case. Thank you. Hello, my name is uh, Asad Nakvi. You, you talked about the middle class as an engine uh, for democracy or accountability. Uh, I was wondering if you could spend some time talking about uh, the middle class when uh, 
it goes the other way and veers towards fascism, mm -hmm. communism, ethno-nationalism, yes. mm -hmm. and so forth. Well, there's two nice broad ones to, to mm -hmm. start with. Okay. Uh, so the interest group question is a very interesting one because uh, there's a long tradition that says that interest groups are actually good, beginning with Alexis de Tocqueville and Robert Putnam and, you know, I mean, because an interest group is simply citizens getting together to promote interests in common. Uh, and the question is, um, you know, how do you reconcile this with a very negative story that's told about interest groups? Uh, I think part of the problem is money, frankly, in mm -hmm. the United States, because our Supreme Court, for reasons that are really beyond me, in a couple of major decisions has basically said that spending money in politics is equivalent of free speech. Uh, and <laughs> as long as the court says that, you know, there's really no way of regulating uh, money. And so what you've seen is a progressive dismantling of whatever, you know, relatively modest barriers there were. Uh, the other thing is that I actually just think that parliamentary systems work better than presidential systems mm. in respect to interest group lobbying because, you know, in Germany or the UK, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for a lobbyist to go to an individual MP because, you know, with party discipline and everything else, uh, the kind of influence that they can exercise is, is a lot lower. So some of this is very specific to the way that Americans organize their government. Uh, on the question, yeah, so the middle class, that's absolutely right that in Egypt, uh, there was a lot of middle class support for CC uh, and, and the reversal of, you know, and getting uh, Morsi out of power. In Latin America during the 60s and 70s, there was middle class support for a lot of the military takeovers in Thailand, uh, a lot of the Thai middle class has basically turned against uh, democracy. Mm -hmm. So there's no automatic connection between being middle class and supporting democracy. Middle classes vote their own self-interest. And there are times, and, and I think this is why it's important to have a broad middle class, as, as broad a middle class as possible, because in a situation where the middle class is relatively small and feels endangered, uh, mm. they're likely to support you know, a, a strong government that will prevent the masses from taking over and doing a lot of redistribution. I think if you talk to most middle class Chinese today and they, you ask them, do you want one man, one vote in China? They'd say, absolutely no, because that's gonna unleash all these mm. populist pressures for redistribution, it's gonna destroy the, uh, the Chinese economy, and they're probably right about that, you know, quite frankly. Uh, so I think that, you know, the trick is to get uh, a sufficiently large middle class that most people can mm. buy into the system without, you know, having that kind of, uh, that kind of fear. Right. Gentleman here in the middle first. Here you had a question. Yep. Do you still want to ask your question? Yep. There's a microphone coming if you do. And here. We'll do these two together. Wait for the microphone. Okay. Right. Thank you very much, Professor. My name is Zhen Ho from the Overseas Development Institute based in London. Um, just to pick on just what you just said over there, uh, I come from China myself, and I regard myself as one member of the middle class. <laughs> You're definitely correct in saying we, we don't want one man, one, okay, one vote. Okay, good, good. And, but, but then you said if the middle class is broad enough, I mean, f f 450 million people as a middle class, mm -hmm. if that's not broad enough, wh what is broad enough? Mm -hmm. um, Judge, I mean, my, 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 my question actually relates to something you said earlier regarding a quote from uh, Professor Huntington about in order to limit power, you have to generate power first. I'm just wondering whether that pushes us to more of a developmental stage argument. In other words, whether you have to be rich enough or powerful enough as, as a state to have a democracy. Or in other words, is democracy a luxury good? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, on that thought, is democracy luxury good? We have to be rich and powerful enough. And gentlemen here, microphone coming, I'll give you a second. Yep. Yes, coming right there. Right there, thanks. Hi, my name is Barry Tomlin. I'm from the London Academy of Diplomacy. I'd like to take you back to the beginning of your talk. I am very concerned about what is happening right now in uh, the Maghreb and in the southern Mediterranean states. I see a major threat being posed, first of all, to the trans-Mediterranean shipping lanes as the danger of transnational crime and terrorism develops there, and eventually, with no real support, uh, a danger to the northern Mediterranean states. So I see a major international crisis brewing here, and so do commentators within the region. Here's my question. It seems as though the only way that one's going to be able to look at this seriously is through international support. 
We face a situation where, as you've already suggested, that some of the major org international organizations, including NATO, may not be fit for purpose in this arena. We also maybe face a situation where people would like to have some kind of Marshall Plan of Development, but we have no Marshall, we have no plan, and no money to pay for it. <laughs> so the situation is this. Question, are there please. international organizations which are helpful and able, such as IMO or indeed maybe Interpol, able to introduce better security precautions in the region which might stem the tide of violence which is currently happening? Thank okay. you. Okay. Uh, yeah. Should oh, I take the, yeah, yeah, get the last fine. two yeah. in and okay. then you can yeah, wrap them all together? Gentleman waiting there. Yep. And we're going to come down the left hand corner afterwards. Yeah. Um, you um, have made light of the Islamist challenge in the long term, and I tend to agree with you. Nonetheless, the, um, ISIS was able to get the European governments to dance to its own tune. And uh, we need not to mention 9-11 in the States. Um, but my question really is about the idea of a caliphate. Doesn't the resurgence of this uh, ancient concept in a way show that your previous claim that history has come to an end, that history actually goes back? It goes back to a concept of which was supposed to be dead. It's coming back. Okay, last question. Here. Go. Thank you. Uh, Filippo Costa, King's College London. Um, I'd like to go back to what you said at the beginning of your talk when, they, according to you, the US will be much happier now whether the Iraq and Afghanistan and other states will be just states and not just democratic states. Um, speaking about this, how would you suggest to overcome the dilemma between state enhancement and state building and normative, mm -hmm. uh, concern, normative, normative, normative concerns? Um, and Related to this, I find quite ironically, quite ironic that the regional organizations most concerned with order and respect of the rule of the systems are exactly those in Eurasia, Southeast Asia, and Africa, such as the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, ASEAN, and so forth. Thank you. Okay, the time is yours, Francis. You've got four big questions there. And okay. At least one, one end of history oh, is the end of history. Yeah. Yeah. One had to come up somewhere. Else. Yeah. So, you know, a broad middle class, in my view, is a, is a society in which a majority of people are middle class. I just think that if you have a very large uh, group of very poor people, as China does today, you know, it, it, it's simply going to generate uh, these Latin American type pressures for redistribution, and that's in, in itself polarizing and uh, destabilizing. Um, actually, I can answer maybe a couple of the questions at the same time about the relationship of security, state building, mm. democracy. Uh, so my mentor, Huntington, you know, believed in the authoritarian transition. He said, you gotta build strong authoritarian states first and then worry about limiting them through democracy. This has happened in a number of places like uh, Korea and Taiwan that subsequently did become democracies. I think if you can, you know, if this kind of sequencing happens, that's what happened in Europe, by the way. I mean, mm -hmm. Europe had strong states way before it had democracy. So that's one route, but I don't think that normatively or prescriptively that's necessarily the way to go. Because first of all, most <laughs> political politicians can't control that. I mean, they can't mm -hmm. say, okay, now we're gonna build a state and then we'll, you know, in 25 years, we're gonna think about democratic participation. I think, you know, for better or worse, we gotta work on all of these things simultaneously. Mm -hmm. I just think that you can't forget about the you know, the, the state building side of it, in, in specifically in terms of security, uh, there I think that there is actually a much more intimate connection between security and democracy than many people realize. Um, you can see this uh, in Latin America right now where Colombia, uh, for example, has gotten a hold of its crime, I mean, the, the kind of extreme mm -hmm. narco trafficking problem in places like Medellin have been conquered as a result of more democratic participation uh, and control of the police and the whole policing process. And so I don't think that they're nearly at as much as odds as many people think. And in fact, some of the worst things you can do in terms of state legitimacy is, you know, the Mano Duro that just puts everybody in jail and, you know, lines people up against the wall and shoots them. Um, the caliphate, I just don't, you know, get real. I mean, this, I think this is a fantasy of a bunch of 17-year-old guys with Kalashnikovs that 
you know, it's impressive that they've actually been able to do as much as they have uh, already, but state building is really hard work, and what they've actually managed to do is unify both the Saudis and the Qataris and the Iranians, <laughs> you know, against them, that they're bad and, and they, they need to be um, uh, reined in. Uh, so uh, if they're still around in, in, you know, five years, then we can have another discussion uh, about that. Um, yeah, and, and finally, the question about the danger to shipping and security and the Marshall Fund. So th this has one been one of the painful lessons, I think, of Iraq and Afghanistan is that actually creating, helping another country create strong institutions from the outside is really, really difficult uh, to do. And resources by themselves are not enough. What the United States proved in Afghanistan is as long as you're willing to stay there, in force, pumping billions of dollars in, you can keep that regime going. But the moment you pull out, all bets are off. And I think that that's a lesson, you know, in general that we've learned in the international community. Yes, we can stabilize the Solomons or Timor-Leste or, you know, other places, but it's an ongoing commitment that uh, most Western taxpayers just don't want to pay mm -hmm. for. Uh, and I don't think we've solved that problem yet, because uh, just talking about a Marshall Plan is, I think, politically not realistic uh, for, for very many places. Well, look, thank you very much to you. Thank you for taking so many questions. Thank you for very good questions from our members uh, here today. Um, your title of your book, as you said now, is Political Order and Political Decay. You've not committed as to which one's going to come out on top. If you'd like to know which way it's leaning, there are copies of the book here. I don't think you can take them. I think you're going to have to buy them. But they are here at the front if you'd like them. They might even get a signature as well. Could you please give a very strong hand for Francis Fukuyama? Thank you.